vector form. Um, AX equal lambda X for this particular A matrix for this problem. And if I do that, I get this here, right? Right, 2x1, 5x2 equals lambda x1, and then 0, 2 equals lambda x2. All right, no problem. Um, pull all the terms onto the left-hand side. Gather the terms in here involving x1. Gather the two terms here involving x2. You get this. <coughs> Looks okay so far. Now, we only, we only have one eigenvalue, right? So... The, now it looks problematic <laughs> because before I, you know, I said, well, take each eigenvalue and plug it in. Well, we only have one eigenvalue, so I guess we'll just plug in that one and see what happens. Right, so if you plug in 2 here, it makes that term 0 and it also makes this term 0. So you're left with this here. Okay? So what does that tell you? Well, if you look at that set of equations, it tells me x2 has to be 0. Because if x2 is 0, you can't, if it's, x2 is not 0, you can't satisfy the first equation. So x2 has to be 0. What's x1? x1 is anything you want. Any x1 satisfies that equation. Those two equations, right? So I just picked two that I liked. Because I, I wanted to. I had to make them both have, so I have two eigenvectors. They both have the second component being 0, and I just picked 1 and minus 1, because I can pick whatever I want. Okay? So you see the problem with these two eigenvectors well, it's not a problem so far, but it will be later, is that they're linearly dependent, right? I take this one times minus one and I get this one. So it's just the nature, if you have repeated eigenvalues, you get linearly dependent eigenvectors. Nothing you can do about it. And so far it's not a problem, but it, it will be. will be later. All right? So again, um, not terribly difficult. You, again, for the, something like this, if, if the problem was bigger, like, if I give you a problem like this on a test, let's say, then I'm liable to give you a 2 by 2 problem or a very carefully selected 3 by 3 problem, right? Because otherwise, you won't know how to take the determinant. And you won't know how to find the roots. I mean, do you guys know how to find the roots analytically for a third order polynomial? There is an equation, actually. It's, it's complex, but there is an analytical solution. But, right, so, so either I'm going to give you a simple problem like this or I'm going to give you a 3 by 3 case that somehow is really simple. Right? What kind of 3 by 3 cases are simple? Uh, triangular, for example, or something like that. Okay? So, you know, as usual, we'll do very simple problems in the lecture, and then when we go to do real problems or realistic problems, we'll use MATLAB. Because no one's going no to find the eigenvectors of a 10 by 10 matrix by hand. Okay? So you might say, well, why do we even do it for a 2 by 2 matrix? Because if you don't do it for a 2 by 2 matrix, you don't know what an eigenvector or value is. You see? So that, that's the reasoning. All right. So now the third case, and I hope you like complex algebra or remember something about it. It's not too difficult. So I give you this particular I, uh, matrix A, okay, carefully crafted, as you might expect. Subtract off um, lambda I, and when I do so, I get this um, thing here, right? Again, just subtract lambda from the diagonal. And again, you could do lambda I minus A if you want. It makes no difference, okay? Now take the determinant of this 2 by 2 matrix. And that's going to consist of this element times that minus that one times that one. Okay. Now this is this is a pain to compute this thing, to be frank. <laughs> but well, I guess it's not. You just have a lot of minus signs, right? It's so. What did I do? I took a minus. Well, I didn't do that actually. I took a minus. Right. You pull a minus sign out of this term and a minus sign out of term. This term they both become one plus lambda. And there's two minus signs, so it actually becomes plus. That's where I got the lambda, 1 plus lambda squared. That just comes directly from these two terms. And then I have a minus minus here, so that's plus 1. And it's just keeping track of minus signs, that's all. All right, so now you've got this particular um, polynomial. And so if we were to try to find the roots of this, I just wrote the roots of this as, as like by inspection, or at least that's what you'd think, right? But of course, I <laughs> plugged them into MATLAB, but how would you do it? You'd obviously use quadratic equations. So this polynomial is, um, what, it's lambda squared plus 2 lambda plus 2, right? Correct me if I'm wrong, please. I usually am, as we've learned, but I think that's right. So if you want to find the roots of this thing, then you plug it in the quadratic equation, right? So it's minus b, right? This is like a, a plus b, c, okay, you know. Minus 2 plus or minus 2 squared 
minus 4 times 1 times 2 over 2 times 2. Is that right? No, it's 2a. Okay. Got that? Okay, looking good. So this is minus 2 plus or minus square root. And what's this thing? So this is 4 minus um, 8, right? So this is minus 4 all over 2. And everyone knows, I hope, that the square root of minus 4 is i times the square root of 4. Right, you pull up. Yeah. And that is 2, this term is 2i. Right? So you have minus 2 divided by 2 plus or minus 2i divided by 2. That's where I got these two things here. Right? All right. Okay. So we have two eigenvalues, like promised, they are distinct, right? They're not the same, uh, but they they're happen to be complex, which is, it is what it is, okay? When we, when we go to be sol solving differential equations, I'm going to tell you that we're going to use these eigenvalues and eigenvectors to solve the differential equations. And systems that have these kind of complex eigenvalues have particular behavior. It's an oscillatory kind of behavior, which I'll show you. But for now, we're just computing them. All right? Okay, great. We've got two eigenvalues. Now we've got to find two eigenvectors. Yeah, that doesn't look as fun now because we're going to have to do a lot of complex algebra here, but it's not, not too difficult. So there's our matrix A. There's our two eigenvalues. So as before, I multiply the two equations out, you know, AX equal lambda I for this matrix A to get the um, scalar equations. In principle, you only need to do this with one equation because you know they'll end up being redundant in the end, but I'm just proving that each time. So, you know, I'm forming the, this equation, <coughs> ax equal lambda x. And so, right, the, this equation comes from the first row, that equation comes from the second row. I don't want to bore you too much. You've seen it. Then I'm going to pull the two e terms involving lambda over onto the left-hand side of the equation, and I'm going to generate this. Okay. So those are two equations, and now I need to, um, for some reason I forgot the subscripts, I'm not sure what, <laughs> why. Right, so the first case is lambda 1 and the second case is lambda 2. I just didn't write the subscript for some reason on the lambda. So I'm going to use the first eigenvalue and I'm going to plug it into those two equations. Okay, so here's where you have to be a little bit careful. Let's see if I did it right. I know I did it right. I, c I found the answer with MATLAB, <laughs> right? I mean, that's legitimate, right? If you guys do a homework assignment, if you show all the work, then I, it, would be, it would be smart to see if the answer looks right using MATLAB, right? You just can't say, you know, I give you some 3 by 3 matrix and you have one line, here's the eigenvalues. I'm like, where'd those come from? You're like, I don't know. Okay. So, but you can certainly use it to check your work. I always do. There's the first eigenvalue. Plug it in these two equations. Let's see what we get here, right? So, Let's see if I like this. So this equation here, okay, so you got a lot of minus signs. So you get minus lambda, so that, that becomes a plus one, cancels this, then you're left with a plus, no, actually a minus i here. Do you see, you see what I'm saying, right? It's just it's hideous to hear, okay? And it's worse to say. But um, let's just say I took this thing, plugged it in here, and because of the signs, the one ended up canceling, you get a minus i from that term then you still have this term here. And if you plug in the lambda into this term, okay, well, it's the same term. You'll get something that looks very similar, okay? Right? This term is, looks the same as this term here. So you get this. So you got two equations, okay? Are these two equations linearly, I promise you they'd be linearly dependent, right? So here's my claim. If I multiply this across this equation by i, I'll get this equation. Right, because you'll get I, minus i squared here, and that's actually plus 1. Right? So if I multiply this equation by i, that obviously puts an i right there. But here I get minus i squared. i squared is minus 1. Minus i squared is plus 1. That gives me an x1 there. So these are the same equation. They're linearly dependent by i. <coughs> okay? Um, so as usual, that's what I expect. So I just need to find some equation that's at that some eigenvector that satisfies this equation, okay? I chose this solution here, x1 equal 1, right? So if you take the second equation, <coughs> I'm tired of coughing. Just 
So what is the second equation there? It's um, x1 minus i x2 equals 0. So I picked this guy to be 1, right? So 1 minus i, ooh, sorry, x2 equals 0. And that means that if you want this thing to be equal to 0, then you need x2 here to be equal to, I think, minus i. Right, because minus i will give you um, plus i squared, which is minus 1. 1 minus 1 is 0. It works. Okay? So that's where I came up with. So I picked um, x equal 1 and I used either equation. The second one's easier to use to find that x2 had to be minus i. And then if you do <coughs> the same procedure here by using this other eigenvalue, which is this guy here. I'm starting to sneeze, but now what I'm doing is putting my hand. My hand's got chalk. So it's just making the situation worse. <laughs> I know you feel for me. It's fine. All right. Um, second eigenvalue, there it is. Plug it in right there for lambda. If you write out the equations, which you can check yourself, you end up getting this. In this case, um, I again picked um, x1 to be 1, and then I figured out it's different than this one. It's that x2 actually ends up being i instead of minus i. Okay? <coughs> so. Two eigenvectors corresponding to two eigenvalues. They're, de they're linearly dependent. At least I think they should be, right? Because I don't think there's any way to multiply the first one and get the set. No, obviously not. Okay? So they're linearly independent, but they're not, they're not real. They're complex. So complex eigenvalues give you complex eigenvectors. It's all right. Okay? Okay. Looks good. Now, we want to talk about something called... Um, Diagonalization of a matrix. Okay. To introduce this, I have, so here, here's my goal, and this goal will become clear when we solve differential equations. I want to do the following. You give me um, a matrix A, okay, and then I'll give you back a, a, diagonal, a diagonalization of A. That means everything is zero except along the diagonal. So I'm going to take the matrix A and convert it into a matrix that's a diagonal matrix. That's called diagonalization, not surprisingly. Okay? We'll see why that's um, useful in a minute. Or not a minute, in a while. But we'll just do it now. Okay? So there's some terminology, maybe a little mind twisting, but okay. So if you have um, <coughs> an n by n matrix, which is all we're considering, it has n distinct eigenvalues, then the eigenvectors will be linearly dependent. Independent, I'm sorry. Right? Distinct eigenvectors give you linearly independent eigenvectors. And if you have linearly dependent eigenvectors, that's called a basis. I don't know why I chose to write it this way. Just because I did it in the past and I didn't want to change. I don't know. All I'm trying to say in this statement is if you have eigenvalues that are distinct, you'll get eigenvectors that are linearly independent. That's it. Okay? All right. So if you have a ma matrix that has repeated eigenvalues, it may not be possible to find linearly independent eigenvalues. That's what the second statement says, and that's discussed more in the text, but it's beyond the scope of what we can cover in the time we have. Okay? So let's just assume that does not happen. So we're not going to consider any further the case where we get repeated eigenvalues. They could be real, they could be complex, but they're not repeated. Okay? All right. So here's a definition. Okay, let's say I have a matrix P, okay? It's any matrix you want. I'm going to pick a particular one in a second, but let's just say I have a matrix P. And I perform the following operation. <coughs> I multiply on the left-hand side of A by P inverse and on the right-hand side by P, and I create a new matrix called A hat, okay? Don't ask me why. I want to, okay? Um, the matrix A and A hat are called similar to each other, okay? And if you, another way to write this equation is, um, well, that's the wrong color chalk, is um, P times A equals A, A times P, right? So I'm looking for a solution to this equation. To solve it, if P is invertible, then I can do it like this, right? And if you can find two, two, two such matrices, this is actually this guy, um, those matrices are called similar, okay, A and A hat, 
are called similar matrices. Okay. So if you have two similar matrices in that sense, they're going to have the same eigenvalues. You know, as usual, I just state the stuff without proving it. I think you'll be happy with that. Okay. So if you know the eigenvectors, eigenvalues of the matrix A, you know the eigenvalues of the matrix A hat because they're similar to each other. Okay. And if you happen to have the eigenvectors of the matrix A, then you can easily find the eigenvectors, the matrix A hat, because they're related like this. So <coughs> if you have a particular eigenvector of A, then if you compute this thing Y by taking P inverse times X, that'll be an eigenvector of the matrix A hat. Okay? All right. So this is just kind of some kind of machinery. Okay. So my real goal is to do a particular type of similarity transformation that is going to work as follows. Okay? So I'm going to do, do the following. So, first thing I say is assume the n by n matrix has an eigenbasis. You might say, what the? That just means assume all the eigenvectors are linearly independent. Okay? That's what an eigenbasis is. Okay? So in other words, assume all the eigenvalues are distinct, then all the eigenvectors will be linearly independent, and that's, you say the matrix A, A has an eigenbasis. Okay? All right, so now I'm going to form this matrix, which I wrote over here earlier, but it looks like I partially erased it. So I'll start over. So, so here's the idea. I, ha I have a matrix A, right? I want to find its eigenvalues and eigenvectors. I solved this problem. I got lambda 1 and lambda 2 and so on and so forth. And then I got corresponding eigenvectors for those eigenvalues called x1, x2, right? So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take these eigenvectors that I've got and I have n of them if it's an n-dimensional matrix and I'm going to put them as columns. So I'm going to form a matrix here. This matrix will be n by n. The first column is the first eigenvector. The second column is the second eigenvector until I get to the last eigenvector. Okay? That matrix X has a name and it's called the so-called modal matrix. Okay? So you understand? You solve the eigenvalue problem. You have all the eigenvectors in hand. You take all those eigenvectors, stack them into columns, and you form an n by n matrix. That matrix called a capital X is called the modal matrix. Okay, you haven't accomplished much so far, I have to admit, but um, the amazing thing is if you do the following, it will, will happen. So this is a similarity transformation. The particular matrix P, remember, sorry, I introduced this matrix P. Now the matrix P is the matrix X. So the, what I did before is for any matrix, it was called P, now it's for a particular matrix called X, the modal matrix. I do a similarity transformation. I take A and multiply on the, f on the left by X inverse. X inverse is guaranteed to exist, right? Because I just, I assume that these columns are linearly independent. This is where you get into trouble if you have repeated eigenvalues because then these columns are linearly dependent and this thing can't be inverted. So I'm not, I've, I've assumed that problem away with this first statement up here, right here. Okay? All right. So I multiply A on the left by X inverse, on the right by X. And then the amazing thing is the resulting matrix, which I'll call D, is a diagonal matrix. And along the diagonal are the eigenvalues. When I first saw that, I thought, you guys don't get the eureka feeling I got, apparently, when I saw that. <laughs> I'm not sure what that says. It probably says something really disturbing about me and almost nothing about you. But anyway. Um, <laughs> So, all right, if you take this modal matrix, do this similarity transformation, you're guaranteed to get a matrix D that has a diag the elements along the diagonal. Um, okay, so you could see this could be a pretty imp useful thing because, um, well, I'll, I'll come back to its usefulness. I'll, I'll just distract from the discussion right now. Okay. So what I'm going to do an example of this in a, in a minute, but so for any arbitrary matrix A, as long as the eigenvalues are distinct, then you can perform this, cal this calculation here and you're guaranteed to get a diagonal matrix with the eigenvalues on the diagonal. I'll show you th two examples of that. Okay, and this is so-called companion relationship, so this is just a matter of uh, manipulating matrices here. 
I feel like writing on the board today. I think it's my desire to inhale chalk. By the way, my allergies all started when I, when I cleaned my garage. You, know, don't you, you guys don't have, I don't know if you guys have cars too, but you don't have a garage, right? But if you park your car in the garage the whole winter, you get like 20, 20 tons of sand, right? And so then I made the mistake of sweeping all that sand and now I've got allergies. All right, back to eigenvectors. Um, that was a so-called sidebar. You ever seen that when you read a magazine and they've got that little thing on the side that's like a separate story? Okay, you just got a sidebar right there. All right. Okay, so we got this thing here. Um, X inverse A times X. And so if I want to, I can multiply on the right, I'm sorry, on the left-hand side of this equation by X. Right? And x times x inverse is i, right, by definition of what the inverse is. So that gives you xd equals ax. And then if I want to, I can write, multiply on the right-hand side since x is invertible. I can do this. And again, x times x inverse is i, so I've just generated the equation that's written on the board, which now is written too low on the board for you to see, probably is that, which I think is what I have up here, okay? So in other words, you can go back and forth between A and D if you like, okay? All right, so let, let's see how this, this thing works, or if it works at all. Okay, so here's an uh, example with just nothing but equations at this point. So there's my matrix A. I've already, I've already done this. This was the first example I did where we had r real distinct eigenvalues. We already did this. So those are the eigenvalues and those are the corresponding eigenvectors. It's on four or five slides earlier. <coughs> okay? All right. So now I'm going to form this matrix. It's going to be a two by two matrix in this case. I'm going to put the two eigenvectors as columns. And there they are. There's the matrix X. Okay? Now I'm going to form X inverse as the inverse of this matrix. You remember how to take hopefully the inverse of a two by two matrix? It's one over the determinant of the matrix. Yeah, 1 over determinant. The determinant of this thing is that times that minus that times that. So it's 1 um, minus, minus 6, which is also known as 7. Okay. And then you take these two elements, swap them. They're the same, so it doesn't make any difference. You negate these two elements. You just have to go back and look um, if you don't remember how to do it. So there's the inverse of this matrix. Easy to compute analytically for a 2 by 2 matrix. And now I'm just going to prove to you that this works. So I'm going to take, <coughs> do this calculation. So there's X inverse, there's A, and there's the matrix X. Okay? So what did I do first here? Look like I multiplied these two matrices times each other first. Okay? And for example, we don't want to go through this all because it's too boring, but you get the first element by taking this row times this column. Right, you get 1 minus 6, which gives you minus 5, and so on. Everyone knows how to multiply matrices, I hope, at this point. So then those two multiplied together gives you this. And if you multiply this times this, so for example, um, if you take, if you want to know this element here, you take the first row times the second column, and you get 1 times 4 minus 2 times 2. So it's 4 minus 4, that's where the 0 comes from. So if you do that calculation, you get that. Okay. That's a diagonal matrix, and that's the two eigenvalues along the diagonal. Yeah? What's the benefit of having this method if, in order to get the, the, um, the, the axes, you already have to have the eigenvalues? Could you formulate the matrix at the end without having to do all this? Yeah, uh, yeah. So the, the, the question is, it's not really, it's kind of a statement, <laughs> but it's like, why are you doing this? Because if you know this is true, then you know this will be the answer, because on the previous slide you told me this would always occur. So I'm just kind of proving it's true. But certainly what's, what's being argued here is I can immediately say that D equals this because that's the two eigenvalues and I know when I do this it'll, it'll work. I'm just demonstrating for this case it works, but you always know it does. So if you wanted to know what this diagonal matrix was, you could write it right first step right after this. Okay? Just proving it works. Okay. So as usual, I was going over these notes, you know, and I thought you know what I'm not going to do? I'm not going to finish 10 or 15 minutes early. So then I added this example, okay? This is what I spend my nine nights doing if I'm not watching basketball, all right? <laughs> um, so I came up with this example. 
just to give you an idea that this could all be done by three by, for a three by three case. And I think I'll write nothing on the board here so I can turn the lights off. Okay, so let's say I give you this example. It's a little more complex, obviously, but all the same um, arguments still apply. So there's my matrix A. You might think that's a weird matrix. It looks kind of weird. I got it from somewhere. I'm not going to explain where, but let's just say that's it. And so now I'm going to want to compute the eigenvalues. So the first step in computing the eigenvalues is to form the matrix A minus lambda I, as usual. So that just consists of um, subtracting off, although I clearly lied here. This is actually lambda I minus A. Remember when I said it doesn't matter? It doesn't matter, but you still should say what you did, right? Um, you can see here I didn't actually form A minus lambda I, I formed lambda I minus A if you look at what this is, right, because all the lambdas are positive, so clearly I didn't subtract them. I'm just saying there's a typo. That's all I'm trying to say, all right? Typographical error, I'll fix it. All right. Um, so now I need to find the determinant of this guy, right, because I need to find the characteristic equation. To do that, I have to find the determinant of that 3 by 3 matrix. All right. Now I happen to know how to find the determinant of a 3 by 3 matrix by, by memory. Okay, I gave it to you in the notes. It's back in the notes where I talked about determinants. Um, so I don't, I'll just, here's how I remember it for any case. It has, it, there's six potential terms, okay. That times that times that, that's the first term. I don't know, they don't even want to do that. You'll not remember what I'm going to tell you. Go back and look in the notes. I use the formula in the notes. There's six terms that involves um, six formulas going this way and, sorry, three going this way and three going backwards. It ends up, because you have a couple of zeros here, you only get three terms, okay? And those are the three terms you get. So if you don't know how I got that for the three by three matrix, go back and look at the lecture, one of the first lectures on linear algebra where I take, tell you how to find the determinant. Okay. So if you multiply this thing out, you get this, okay? Now, in, in, a, in an unbelievable fashion, okay, that complex looking thing ends up being lambda plus one times lambda plus two plus lambda plus three. I started there and found the matrix and went backwards, obviously. All right. Just to make it easy. So you can see there's three eigenvalues here. Not surprisingly, a three by three matrix, you get three eigenvalues. They're minus one, minus two, minus three. They're all real. They're all distinct. Okay. So now you want to find the eigenvectors corresponding to that. Okay. You have to do this three times now. Okay. So what I've done here in the first step is write out all the equations in scalar form as usual. So just to make sure that we're all on the same page, I know I told you not to write this down, so I hope you're paying attention. Um, so the first equation is minus 6x1 minus 11x2 minus 6x3 equal lambda x1. And then you write it for the other two equations and you get those equations right there. Okay? All right. Do the usual thing. Pull, pull the three ter the terms involving lambda here onto the left-hand side of the equation. You generate these three equations. Now what's going to happen is you're going to have two equations. Two, so you have three equations there, right? But two of those equations are going to be independent and the third one's going to be redundant. Okay? You're right. When you had two equations, one was independent, the other one was redundant. And now we have three. It's going to be two independent and the third one redundant as I'm about to show you. Okay? So for the first eigenvalue here, which is minus 1, you can plug it into this equation right, right there and right there and right there. And if I didn't make a mistake, you'll get this set of equations here. Okay? All right. So if you look at that set of equations, you might think I have three equations and three unknowns, right? But the, the step I did over here was convince you that's not the case because if you solve this equation here for x1, you get that. And if you solve this equation for x3, you get that. And if you plug x1 in right there, in other words, minus x2, and you plug x3 in right there, in other words, minus x2, you get that equation. That, that's not unique, right? That just says 0 equals 0, right? Because it's 11x2 minus 11x2. So you only really have these two equations. Because this third one's redundant, I just proved it. Okay? So you have these two equations. So now you're free to pick anything you want. So I don't know, it looks like I picked x2 equal minus 1. And that would make x1 equal 1 and x3 equal 1. So there's the eigenvector for that. It's not unique. It's, it's unique up to any mul scalar multiple. So you can multiply this thing times minus 20 and that still works. It's fine. All right? So 
Now you can keep doing the same thing. I'll go through this quickly, <coughs> pretty quickly at least. Now you've got lambda equal minus two, that's the second eigenvalue. You plug it in there and there and there. And then you generate this set of equations right here. Again, to prove to you that there's only two equations, I solved this equation for x1, this equation for x3. That gave me those two things. If you plug those back in right there and there, you get this equation. That's again zero equals zero. So there's two equations and three unknowns. So I can pick anything I want. So it looks like for this one, I picked x2. So I used this, t these equations here. I picked x2 to be minus two. That made x1, four and x3 equal one. Okay? And then guess what? That's right. I did it a third time. Um, I plugged in my lambda value. I got these set of equations here if you go back and look. And then I solved these two equations for x1 and x3. And I plugged those into this equation and I got this equation and that's zero equals zero. So that's, that's redundant. And now I can do anything I want. Because I like ni nice numbers, I picked x2 equal minus three. And then I got x1 equal nine and x3 equal one. Okay. And then finally, in the ultimate tour de force here, I did the following calculation. I formed, <laughs> all in MATLAB, because I, I didn't want to do it by hand. <laughs> all right. I uh, formed this modal matrix, right? So those are my three eigenvectors that I found. X1, X2, and X3. Put them into a matrix. So it's a three by three matrix called the modal matrix. Then I computed this thing, the similarity transformation. I found the inverse of this, multiplied on the left multiplied A on the right by X, and if you do that, you'll find you get a diagonal matrix in the, as by construction, as we said, the eigenvalues are along the diagonal. All right? So this, this idea of eigenvalues and eigenvectors we'll come back to when we um, start solving linear differential equations, but starting next week, we'll start talking about systems of nonlinear algebraic equations. All right, so here's your homeworks up here if you want to grab them. <laughs> yeah. I was wondering if you could help me find a room for the project because I wasn't, wasn't here for the class. I wasn't just oh. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, can you send me an email? Yeah. And I'll, really I'll figure out what I can do. Okay, okay sure. Can I sneak by you here? Yeah, yeah thanks.